Hello. Welcome to Hope Vineyard Church. Glad you're here. If you're online, if you're in person, it's a wonderful, beautiful Sunday here at uh, in Paxton, and I hope it is wherever you find yourselves to be. Thanks for being with us. My name is Jim, and my wife, Dee Dee, and I are the pastors here at Hope Vineyard Church in Paxton, and we're just saying Merry Christmas. Welcome. We're so close to Christmas now. It's so crazy. I did some wrapping yesterday. I do the wrapping in our house, and uh, I enjoy doing that. It's something that um, blesses my wife, too, because she does not enjoy doing it, and so uh, it's a win-win. And um, I hope you're getting in the spirit. If not, uh, we're going to continue trying to help you out with that. Um, if you're online, take a moment now to like this Facebook page if you haven't already done that. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can always stay up to date with the uh, services. We post those there. Um, and then it's a, it's a great way to stay up to date with what's happening around here. A couple things that you might want to know about for Christmas uh, at Hope around here. Um, next Sunday is our Christmas sweater Sunday. And so we're encouraging everybody, whether you're at home or whether you're here, to dress as festive as you want to. It's a time to celebrate Christmas and put on your best gear. Some people might call it ugly Christmas sweater Sunday. Um, and if that's your kind of bent, then that's good. But we don't want to just like say it's only sweaters. Uh, you can you can just be festive. So let's just festive it up. Um, and then uh, on the following Friday is our Christmas Eve service. Christmas Eve is at 530 this year. Candlelight Christmas Eve service on Friday, December 24th at 530. And we want to encourage you to invite friends and family come for a uh, carols and this Christmas story. It's part of our tradition here at Hope Vineyard to reflect on that and, and sing those carols on Christmas Eve. And then the following Sunday, the 26th, is a stay-at-home Sunday as a way to give our uh, volunteers time off and to uh, just relax at the end of a very busy season for us. Uh, we have our stay-at-home Sunday. We'll probably check in on that Sunday morning online but it's a time to, uh, to just chill and, um, and say thanks to our volunteers who serve week after week and the tech crew, people who serve on the, vol and on the worship team, our, our reemergence into Kids Church. Um, and so uh, since it's so close to Christmas Eve and Sunday, uh, it, just, it just makes sense to us to do that. And so we'll be back at it again the following Sunday, January 2nd, for, uh, to start the new year right with communion and everything else. Um, one other thing that I want to mention today, if you're here in person, you can take home one of these fleece uh, blanket, throw blankets. Uh, these were donated. A whole bunch were donated by someone who comes to the church. We're so grateful for that, um, for this act of generosity. And so um, you can take one of these. And if you know somebody who needs one or if you know a couple people who need these, uh, feel free to take a couple and and give away. Be generous in doing this, and, and, um, and we're going to give the rest away um, if uh, after everybody here gets one, food pantry, nursing homes, we're going to give those because we have a bunch, and we're so grateful for that kind person who donated these throw blankets. There's green, there's red. I haven't even opened up the third box. Uh, I don't know if there's a different color of them, but uh, what's that? They're all also green. So green and red, Christmas, perfect time. And uh, you could use these for your festive Sunday next Sunday, too. Just dress up. Maybe this is a cape. Who knows? Um, but thank you again. Make sure you take them. They're on the, the table on the way out. And I'm going to turn things over to Dee Dee. She's going to be continuing our Christmas Joy series. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. I am very joyful. I'm joyful. I made it here. I <laughs> I'm joyful it wasn't too cold because... I have yet to find my snow scraper for my car, and when it gets really cold, my car gets just, um, even if all the other cars don't, my car gets ice on it, and so I had to walk. So I walked here the whole two miles. It's not like, you know, like eight years ago when you had to walk miles to school. It's just two, two, not two miles, two blocks. I walked two blocks, <laughs> two blocks, made sure my hair wasn't messed up too badly. It was, oh, God's grace, it wasn't windy either, so good day for that and I am joyful and grateful um, this for today um, 
Speaking of joyful and gratefulness, you've noticed that we're talking about joy all season this year. Um, for our whole Advent series is about joy. And that was on purpose because we are, um, it just seemed like there's been a heaviness and a weight to the world. I don't know if anybody else has noticed it, but it seems like it's, it's not hard to, like, you know, try to, be festive and and you know make the lights pretty and enjoy the Christmassy stuff, but there is something that I really felt like God is wanting to break through in this message series on joy. And what's interesting is I follow we're like I'm a part of a Facebook group with a bunch of other um, vineyard pastors and. There were several people saying, you know, like, do you know a good bu um, book study on joy? And, and several people are st starting, like, a Bible study on joy. And I was like, wow, I'm not the only one. I, like, I felt like maybe God did really speak to me. I felt it was kind of like, oh, well, good, because we're talking about joy all four weeks of Advent. Um, and this morning I want to talk about, like, in, in how we think about joy in the Christmas season. And we, it's, it's been interesting, to, as I was thinking about this, that we have a couple different symbols of Christmas. We have the, you know, Jesus and the nativity symbols. And then we have Santa and, and the elves and, like, the presents and all, and that other kind of symbol, which was really adopted from paganism. I mean, there's, there's, we don't have to, so we, we, the early church kind of tried to, like, reframe it, but it, it was pretty much, um, just kind of trying to bring um, pagan festivities or, or other other religious fest festivities that were happening around the Christmas time, and so we were like, well, we're going to celebrate Christmas, and and then and the church really tried to do that quite a bit by adopting other festivities so that people didn't have to give up their fun and happiness and joy in order to celebrate the Christian um, holidays. But in thinking about um, baby Jesus and his symbol of joy to the world, it's kind of like we don't necessarily think of the silent night baby Jesus as this like joyful baby. It's, I guess if we could have, if it would have been like, if there were more songs about like giggly Christ or you know, like that kind of stuff, you know, like cute, 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 you know, patty cake, you know, then we might think a little bit more of, of baby Jesus being full of joy. But it's it's when Jesus is birthed, and it is baby Jesus that we think of when it's when the um, shepherds or when the angels came to speak to the shepherds and told them that there was going to be um, a savior born, and it was going to be br bring joy to the whole world. And um, and so I wanted to like really investigate a little bit about Jesus's own joy this morning. And it, it was really quite interesting what we came up with. So I'm going to pray and then we'll we'll you know pursue this a little bit more. Father, we thank you that at Christmas time you have given us your son and it's actually your son that brings us joy. And we thank you that you've you remind us, you know, you, you've allowed other things like Santa and elves and elf on a shelf to remind us of of the joy that you give. But it's actually you that um, we get to experience, and we're and so this morning I want to focus on 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 Jesus and really think about your joy and this joy that you give us, Lord. I ask that you open our hearts to to receive this, and that you would lift off the heaviness that you know the world has um, given us. And that you will you will allow us to enter into your joy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So um in in Luke two ten through twelve it says um, the angels came to the shepherds. And I know we used this scripture a couple weeks ago. We're going to use it next week, too. So we're talking because it's the, it's the one scripture that really talks about this joy that has come to the world because of Jesus. And the angels talk to the shepherds, and they say, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in a town of Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. 
So we see that these the story about this baby that's wrapped in the manger, this this baby Jesus, who we later find out to be God's son, um, and the Messiah who's going to bring change to the entire world and bring and and bring God's kingdom to the world, that that Jesus is born in the manger, and because of that, we get to experience joy. So is that the same kind of joy that we get when we, you know, like see Santa, ha, 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 you know, like ho, ho, hoing and, um, and, and being jolly? Or is it a different kind of joy? Well, my guess is it's a different kind of joy. Because Santa can be jolly sometimes. But Santa, I mean, if he was jolly all the time, I mean, even Santa would be like, he has to have down times, at least when he sleeps. But this joy that we get from Jesus doesn't have any downtime. And yet, we're not all going around going, ha, 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 ha. Um, Even though we did sing that in a song when I was growing up. The whole verse, um, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The whole verse is, ha, 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 ha. We're not going to sing it this morning, but you can imagine the rest. Um, The church not only... um, Remember, the early church wrote down these stories, and not only of Jesus' birth, but Jesus was noted to the early church as being a, someone who encompassed joy. And he actually talked about joy. And we don't know a whole lot about Jesus' life in between when he was a baby born and there was announcement that there was going to be joy, and when he became you know, 30 and launched in his ministry. We have one little... Or two little caveats. I guess it was probably when he was about two that he ended up having to go um, leave and go to Egypt for a little bit to escape being murdered with all the other two-year-olds around that time. And it was around when he was 12 that he was lost some t- somewhere in Jerusalem, and um, it turned out he was in the temple, and after it took his parents two days to find him. He said, well, of course I'm here. I'm listening to my father's preaching, which was pr- it probably not as obnoxious of a statement as it sounds to us <laughs> when we read it. He was, but he was basically saying, this, this is where I need to be. And then, turns out, he grows up and becomes 30. And in, in the meantime, between when he's 12 and he's 30, his, his, um, he's likely raised for a while as an apprentice to his father, who is a carpenter, um, his father Joseph, his earthly father, and then at some point his father dies because the next we hear of Jesus, he's the oldest male person in charge of um, at this wedding banquet. But the early church was committed to sh- to sharing what it knew of Jesus, and the way even before the gospels um, and the epistle letters were written down, the there were stories that would go around. Um, about Jesus. There were, there were tales of Jesus. There were stories about his life. There were stories of his sayings. There was likely a source that was, you know, that was like the sayings of Jesus and some, um, either it was written down or people were committed to memorizing it. And in all this, these tales of Jesus and this understanding of Jesus, what was passed on was that Jesus was a man of joy. He was, he was filled with joy. There's some um, artist depictions of a laughing Jesus. And, and whereas they might not be the most accurate you know, like pictures you know, of Jesus because we, we don't know exactly what Jesus looks like except he wasn't white, um, is that he was laughing. He's having fun. And it's so different than the Jesus that I have... Um, imagined in my head growing up that was somewhat you know somewhat solemn and somewhat you know like he was just doing good things but he was pretty serious in my mind and so and so imagining Jesus as as laughing and and being free is such an interesting perspective for for me to like look at to look at a little further and it's something that probably without this message series I wouldn't have done because I just am like, I don't know, I just picture in my mind stoic and fierce and, you know, like warrior Jesus more than fun, laughing, you know, Santa Claus Jesus. Um, and yet the, the um, writers of the Bible talk about a time um, in the early Jews actually before Jesus was born, they, there was different things that we call Christophanies now, but there was always a sense that there was a, a personhood 
there was like the invisible God, and then there was a God that would sometimes come and reveal himself. And in the, the Old Testament, that's often referred to as the angel of the Lord. There's also in philosophical thought an idea of, of um, that, that person other than the invisible God being personified as wisdom. And in Proverbs 8, 30 um, to 31, it says, then I would, this is speaking of wisdom personified as a person or as this Old Testament idea of, of, of the invisible God being more than one person. It says, then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. Another um, Old Testament depiction of this other person of God was when David wrote about a future um, a relative of his that would be this Messiah. And in my, his, he says, And God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And then we know that, that the New Testament writers are looking back at these Old Testament um, depictions of this other person of God that's with God as it, and then they're saying well that was Jesus and we know that because in Hebrews um, 1 9 it's the um, the author of Hebrews is trying to say well Jesus isn't you know like another angel because of what angels did they say this and it says you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness therefore your God um, your God has set you before your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. And so the Hebrew writers say, or the writer of Hebrews and the, and the early um, church has this understanding that this, this person of God who was with God from the beginning was now we know that that was Jesus. And not only are they saying, well, that person with God from the beginning you know, was Jesus, they're saying that person of God who was from, um, from the beginning and, and now we know is Jesus, he was filled with delight. He, he was filled with delight because he rested in, in his father's delight. He rejoiced in the world, the inhabited world. He rejoiced in mankind. And, and he was anointed with this oil of gladness. So that Jesus, that second person of the, of the tr um, Trinity, that person that that the he the early um, Israelites didn't quite understand, but had some idea of that baby was born, and it's become good news of great joy for us. The early church also talked about Jesus actually being joyful. So, so these stories that were put together um, and and taken and used to write the gospel um, letters. It's, it's important to understand that the gospel letters were written even after some of the um, epistle letters, like from Paul and, and the people who wrote the epistles. And, and so these were, were sometimes written like 100 years after Jesus. And so these weren't necessarily um, like written by people who were on the ground, um, like if you have like somebody who's a, a news anchor who goes into the into the the war into the battlefield like play by plays or a sports anchor I guess too um for weather um and so these are stories about the important p points of Jesus and so when joy and Jesus being filled with joy isn't an important point it gets passed on if it wasn't that important then it doesn't get passed on um, but the things that come down to us, by the time they make it to the Gospels and the Epistles, this, this is what the early church believes. And it says that not, um, Jesus, in um, Luke 7, it says that Jesus was sometimes accused of, of having too much fun. I mean, it's his, his accuser said, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and a sinners. So Jesus was hanging out with people, and, and people that you know, would have been frolicky people probably, people that were considered sinners or, or, or didn't necessarily exemplify the more stoic relationship um, with God that the... That the um, 
the religious leaders at the time had. And yet Jesus was hanging out with them and enjoying himself. And it's, it's interesting that when we think about evangelism, so often we think of thinking of like things that people ought not do and in sincerely telling them that they just ought not to do it. We don't really think of evangelism in the way that Jesus is like hanging out with people. And he's not necessarily hanging out with people so he can bait and switch them later and say, and by the way, we, I don't really think you ought to be doing that. He's, it's his love it's his relationship with him that eventually moves people in whatever direction the Holy Spirit's leading them to be. And, and it's really fun that to see that Jesus is just hanging out with people. And he's accused of having too much joy. He's a, um, he even explains uh, at one point in Matthew 13, 44, it says, Jesus is talking. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells it and, and um, all that he has to buy this field. So he's explaining, in, we know as other parts of his ministry are telling, you know, like that he's supposed to come and share the kingdom of heaven and, and the, that the kingdom of God has come and that, you know, God's rule and reign is broken through into the present and that is supposed to be received with great joy. So much great, you know, it's supposed to be something that's so amazing that someone would, would um, sell all their possessions in order to acquire it. So we see that Jesus is noted already as a, a man who's full of joy. And I want to take two um, scriptures in j that exemplify this even a little deeper. The first one is a parable that he tells. And it um here he's he's being like put uh, the religious leaders are complaining about him again. And it's in Luke 15 and it says, "Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them." And then Jesus tells this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And then when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous men who don't need to repent. Or suppose the woman has a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and surf and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, in each of these, um, Jesus is addressing the accusation that he shouldn't be welcoming the, the sinners or the, the, um, to eat and, and eating with them. And now, sometimes we have an idea of what sinners means. And we kind of think, well, a sinner is someone else over there who's doing something like that. But when Jesus came to the world, he understood that the whole world had um, rejected the love of the Father. That's the the Israel's relate. It, the story of Israel was this constant relationship of them of them seeming to understand what relationship with God is and, and obeying Him and 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 like turning to Him, and then this seeming to fall away and into corruption and to where people weren't looking out, out for each other and there wasn't a whole lot of, of love being um, revealed. And so when the angels announce that joy comes has come to the whole world, it's with this idea that really no one got it. You know, God, God was continually revealing himself. And we've said in the past that the Old Testament is kind of a picture of, of um God's revel revelation of himself 
to the, the world, and yet we also see some things in the Old Testament attributed to God that really don't seem very um, like what a good and loving God would do. And what Jesus does is he says, well, that's right. That's stuff that a good and loving God wouldn't do. I'm here. I'm here to show you God. I'm here to show you love. I'm here to show you that God doesn't, like the Old Testament would say, well, if there's a, they're a sinner, you know, given these different things, well, then take him out to the um, outside of the city and, and stone them because we can't have them, you know, like messing up our city. The, the law was had of the Old Testament had some things that were contrary to what Jesus actually is revealing about God in the New Testament. In the, in the Old Testament, if things went wrong with people, it was attributed to their own doing. They, they or some of their relatives must have messed up somehow, and they, they're just getting the consequence. And so when Jesus comes and he's actually hanging out with people who, in, who by the Old Testament law would have been like the, like the people you take out to the, to the outside of town and, and throw rocks at, well, it's it's kind of like well the the religious leaders just didn't get that and even though Roman law had outlawed a lot of the rock throwing um, at that time, uh, the the idea of of God actually coming after those who were strayed from Him was a new concept, and so in Jesus in personifying Himself in these parables, he's saying, I'm like the good shepherd. I'm like the, the woman who's lost her coin. I see these people, and I want to reveal to them the love. And in, in the story, it doesn't say, and Jen, Jesus goes out, and he told that sheep they shouldn't have wandered and hit him a couple times with his um, staff. He picks them up, and he holds them, and he brings them home. He loves on them. And it's with great joy he says, I found this, I found this sheep. They didn't know I was loved. They were loved. They were away. They were strayed from me, but I found them. And he, and he says, he calls his friends and celebrates his joy. The word that is used in Greek, I guess there's a, somebody smarter than me, wrote, um, did a word study on this, and they said there was two words, and one is like this sense of happiness, but the other is um, a, a, a sense of sharing, and then when it says the, he called his friends and he, we rejoiced, that word um, that's a compound word of rejoicing is like a sharing in joy, and th that's the kind of um, joy that Jesus had when he was celebrating with those who, who were experiencing the kingdom and, and bringing others into the kingdom. He's not like just happy, like, check, I got another one. He's like, yes, we did it. And so this joy is a joy of, of Jesus. It's not just a joy in how great he is or even how great the Father is. It's a joy that has always been participatory, like, like something that is, is to be entered in. And so Jesus isn't jolly like St. Nick, like, ho, 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 I'm full of joy. He's like, I'm full of joy, and you get to be too. Let's celebrate together. Another picture um, is an example that Jesus shared with, uh, of joy that he shared with 72 of his disciples. We all often hear about 12 disciples that he taught how to um, do the stuff and they preach the kingdom he taught them how to heal the sick and um, deliver demons and then he brought some other ones who were kind of probably in the crowd often but maybe just didn't go like back to dinner with him and he taught them how to do the same stuff he taught them like the kingdom of God has come we have authority God loves people let's go heal the sick and, and deliver people from demons and so he did and these people um, came back, and they were full of joy. And in Luke 10, it tells a story. It says, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to your name. 
And he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes, snakes and scorpions and overcome the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you are pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by the Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. And so Jesus is celebrating the joy that his disciples have when they go out and they get to preach the kingdom and they get to tell the demons to get out of people and they get to heal people. And they're excited and they're happy. And he's saying, you know, it's, it's cool that you got that power. But remember, it's because of this relationship you have of Jesus. And so he's not dissing the, um, the healings and deliverances at all, but he's saying, this is because of the Father. This is because you, God is revealing this to you. He's revealing this kingdom. He's revealing his love for all humanity. This love that, that Jesus knew when he delighted in, in, as, as wisdom personified in um, God's creation. And so I love this story because I can relate to this. I can relate to this because... For many years, I, I prayed on um, a, a large ministry team in a large church with lots of people coming up for prayer. So I had lots of, and there were three services. I mean, it was, it, there was just a lot of opportunity to pray. And I don't think that God is doing less now. I just don't think I'm in the same opportunity, um, have the same opportunity where I have so many connections with so many different people. But there were some weeks where it was so exciting to see God's kingdom breakthrough tangibly and visibly when when people's lives were changed or they were healed or their back felt better or um or whatever oppressive thing was bothering them seemed to leave it was also exciting in more personal personal times with um deliverance ministry and I I know that I don't share the many of these stories because they're personal stories with the people with whom we're, we're ministering but it's not head spinning and, and, and like, eyes bleeding. I mean, it's, it's really not, like, the scary thing that's happening. What's happening is God's love is breaking through into people's lives. And so whether it's a person who, um, had, for some reason, just felt like, like God wasn't with them in a certain trauma, or whether it's a person that, that, um, has has had shameful things occur to them and and that shame that belonged to the offender was placed on them and they thought I can't be seen I can't be loved because of this and love breaks through and freedom comes and they get to say no I'm not going to have be harassed by evil anymore that's that is exciting I actually get like giddy in these experiences and um in in when people spend a long time with me, I just kind of call it deliverance camp because it's like we're, there's lots of laughing involved because we're we're experiencing God, but it's there's just this real joy that comes, and I really can identify with these disciples because I think that they're probably like feeling a little bit giddy when they come back, and and Jesus is saying that's great, and I know He's blessing it, and I know He's saying. But even um, remember, it's about Jesus. Remember, it's about the relationship with the love of the Father. And I hold on to that when the things I want to see aren't seen, and when we pray, and when we when we, the things that of God are slow in coming, seemingly, and when um when that ministry, those ministry times aren't happening, and, and I by nature struggle with depression, but my hope comes from from the God inside of me. And 
And I think that that's the joy that God, that is um, the kind of joy that is even deeper than the, than the ministry joy. And yet both are valid. And both are only made possible through the Holy Spirit and through experience with Jesus. But Jesus um, delights in this. And he, he delights that, that this possibility has come because he did see Satan fall from heaven. And he's here to say Satan's power is broken. And so he delights because he knows that because of his birth, because he has come, because of his life that he's going to live, that everything changes. And Jesus gives us his joy. Now, lest we think that he has an easy life, remember that you know he was, he was born in a stable. He, what, there wasn't like he, there wasn't like you know great contents of his birth, and then likely his his he was lost at one point, and I'm sure that he wasn't always hot. He's saying, well, well, of course I'll be in the temple. My guess is maybe he was lost in the temple, and there was a little bit of concern for him, um, and he is, at some point his earthly father died. And he was persecuted, and people tried to kill him even before they did kill him. He, his friend died, and that was pretty sad. Even, and he wept, even though he knew that somehow God was going to do something. Until he did it, he wasn't done, and his friend was dead. He knew he was going to die. That's a pretty heavy weight to carry, to know that that's happening, to know that that's coming. He knew he was going to be betrayed. He... Um, and there were times when he went into the towns and a lot of people weren't healed and a lot of people um, weren't delivered and, and people you know, chased him out of, out of town. So Jesus didn't have this amazing, like, all, like frolicky life, but he, he still, um, by his own words, c- considered him to have a joyful or considered himself joyful. And it was at his last supper, after he knew he was going to be di- um, die, after he knew that his friends were going to betray him, that he tells them um, that he has this conversation with him. In John fifteen eleven, it says, These things I've spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be me- made full. Later, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remains in anguish because of the joy that the child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again. And your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Later, while his friends are sleeping, mind you, he prays this to his father. But now I come to you, and the... and These things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. So Jesus is um, recorded to say that he wants to give us joy. Not just joy, not just ha-ha-ha joy like Santa, but Jesus' joy. The joy that came from the beginning of the world before the world was created. Jesus' joy in mankind. Jesus' joy in his Father. Something we don't have and cannot have on our own, Jesus gives us. In Galatians, this is called the fruit of the Spirit. Now, it's different than the gifts of the Spirit, which are given out like how the Father pleases, right? Or how the Spirit pleases. The fruit of the Spirit is what you have when you have the Holy Spirit. It's something that we have in us. And, it can, and we can grow in it, but it's given to us because of the spirit of Jesus lives in us. So joy is being in the presence of the Father and experiencing his love for mankind. His delight um, in, in you. His delight in, um, in knowing you. Like Just like Jesus, you get to be in the presence of the Father and the Father delights in you. And this is Jesus' joy that he's giving to you to know that. To have that inside of you. We get to partner um, in revealing his love and celebrating with others as his kingdom comes. It's a grace that is present when there's persecution, when there's trouble, when there's grief. When the, when the plan is b- bigger than our own comfort. When we don't see it, 
It's a grace that comes to us. It doesn't mean that we are always laughing and, and, and partying, but it means that we have something in us that we can find beauty, that we can find something bigger than what we ha- um, who we are in our, and that we get to enter into a, a story that is still um, going on. God has given him, given him his, God has given himself in this time. We get to experience what oh, the prophets were only looking forward to. That you and I may experience the way the Christmas baby truly changed the world. That we may experience the oil of gladness. The oil of gladness means it's a gladness that comes with healing. And that um, that was that Jesus had before time began. And that we may experience the delight of the Father and participate in his plan and share the joy of God moving amongst us in community as we reveal love to those who have yet to experience the same kind of joy. So I hope this gives you hope this this season. And I hope that when we are reminded um, of joy from Santa's ho-ho-hos, we can also be reminded of the baby Jesus that grew up and and give um, has given us his joy forever. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the joy of Christmas. We thank you for the joy of participating in Jesus' joy. And we thank you of this time um, and season to be reminded and celebrated. Uh, um, celebrate that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And as we enter into this time of worship through singing and lifting up our voices joyfully before the Lord, let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours is the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, feel free to stand, spread out, clap, shout, dance. Uh, If you're at home, turn it up and sing like nobody's listening except for Jesus. Yes. 
sing glory to the newborn. I'm standing with the rain on my face, finding here such unusual grace. I'm waiting here, standing where the mercy falls. I once was blind, but now I can see. My ears are open. Faith to believe I'm waiting here Standing where the mercy falls Strengthen feeble hands And steady the knees Say to the fearful heart Our God is coming, our God is here. The Lord who rescues, the Lord who redeems. Draw near your people, by your grace we are free. Standing where the mercy falls. We once were blind, now we can see. Our ears are open, blind and fed to believe. We're waiting here. Standing where the mercy
Father, we thank you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you that we can experience your lifting the weight of the world off of us for a moment. We thank you that we can experience your joy. We thank you that we can experience your delight in us, that we can feel free, that we can be known, that we can know your comfort, which means that you're with us. Lord, that, that you haven't left us, that you are here right now. And Lord, we ask that, that your presence and your spirit and your kingdom would break through. And in this moment, I just ask that um, 
I just sense that that there is a breakthrough for certain things that that people for grief um, for pain like especially back pain right now um, and I know that that these are things that people are regularly dealing with it so I'm not necessarily like just picking winners I just feel like God is saying he's here and he loves you and he sees you and he's doing something and so I just I just want to go with it and just say thank you Lord for what you're doing and also like if a uh, persistent cough I'm sure like I'm having words are there other words out here for people who get words that do sense the Lord saying that there's he's doing something He's just, um, we have a word that there's just a, a love that's coming even in the middle of brokenness. Like it's, there's a love that's meeting you. Is that, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Um, and so I just, just, I just pray that and bless that and bless what the Holy Spirit's doing. And um, if any of those things does come to pass, Please, like, let us know, because I don't usually just, I haven't in a while um, given words like that, but it just really felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, there's something I'm doing. And so we just bless that and say yes to that. And Lord, we just thank you for your presence, and we thank you um, for that you have given us your joy, that this is something you, that's yours, and we have it. And Lord, I ask that you continue to teach us what that means. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us out there. Thank you for coming this morning. And being, that we get to do this thing to together. And I, I just, I'm thankful for this church family. And um, we'll see you next week.